Um, so I, I'll start um, uh, with uh, a couple of quotes, uh, I think. Um, so the, the physicist Niels Bohr said that uh, prediction is difficult, especially when it's about the future. Um, so that gives you an idea of the task um, uh, ahead of us. Uh, the, um, uh, a further, uh, we, we rely heavily on models in the game of uh, predictions and projections. But what I want to convince you of is the fact that we don't just use the models, uh, um, the, the raw output from the models. We have to uh, interpret uh, the, the output of the models using our observations and using our physical understanding. Um, we rely heavily on models because observations of the future are not yet available, uh, which is the other quote which is ga gaining some uh, credi uh, credibility from Tom Knutson and Robert Talea, and as pointed out in Gavin Schmidt's uh, excellent TED Talk. Look on the web if you want to see that. I can see my uh, co-CLA, uh, who I wasn't expecting to come, at the, top of the, um, uh, the top of the auditorium, so he can answer the difficult questions. Um, so this uh, uh, picture that Thomas uh, showed of the global mean temperature change um, under uh, these different assumptions about future concentrations of greenhouse gases. Um, I want to sort of unpick this graph a bit and, and uh, tell you uh, a little bit of the insight of how we interpret uh, the output, how we interpret this graph. So the, 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 the temperatures are expressed in terms of anomalies with respect uh, to the 1986-2005 period. That is up to the end of the historical simulations, which are shown in the black curve uh, with the grey uh, shading. And the future scenarios up to the end of this century uh, are shown with the, the red and the blue lines. That's for RCP 2.6 and RCP 8.5. And the shading there represents something about the uncertainty. In fact, it's the 5 to 95 percentile uh, of the uncertainty as computed from the CMIP-5 uh, models. So the task we have is really how to interpret this figure in terms of what we think the real world would do if we followed these concentration pathways. Uh, it's simply a collection of the output of the models that we happen to have, models which are known to be imperfect, share common biases, share common components uh, in some uh, cases, so it's not a statistically unbiased uh, sample. So it's not just the case that we look at these graphs and then conclude something about the real world. We have to make uh, further uh, inferences about um, how to interpret the models. And the way we do that uh, is because um, we have other simulations with the models in which we have more simplified forcing scenarios, in particular where we increase uh, CO2 uh, at 1% per year uh, um, for uh, 80 years, and at the end of that 80-year period, um, the CO2 has doubled, and we can measure the temperature change uh, in the models at that point. And it's a, uh, a simulation, an experiment that can be compared um, uh, very um, clearly uh, between models. Um, also, uh, because we have alternative uh, methods of looking at this quantity called the transient climate response, um, we have a number of different lines of evidence, some of which use complex uh, models, some of which use more simplified energy balance type models, uh, and employ observations of trends, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the, the colored uh, bars, which you see in this figure, are a whole number of different studies, and they are um, uh, the, the likely, uh, or the range of TCR um, from these different studies. And what you see is that they're not all not equivalent, so it depends on your method uh, as to um, how you get out uh, uh, this, this TCR. They all approximately align, apart from one, which is a, a, a bit of an outlier. And we can also look uh, in this figure at the distribution of uh, these, this TCR quantity, the transient climate response, from the CMIP-5 models. And we see that there's a coincidence between the likely ranges, uh, as uh, indicated in the color bars, and this, and this um, uh, CMIP-5 range. And that is a fortunate coincidence. Uh, if it wasn't the case, we would have had to do something different. But because it was, it meant that we could associate the uncertainty in the models, in the raw ensemble output, with our 
assessed uncertainty of what the real world would do um, given a particular concentration uh, of greenhouse gases. Uh, and that means that we associated the 5 to 95% range of uh, the CMIP-5 global mean temperature responses at the end of the century uh, with this uh, uh, likely range, which means, in IPCC speak, greater than 66%. Uh, um, percent. So you can see there's a mixing of percentiles here. What it means is that, that given the range of models, we still think there's a considerable chance that the real world, world would lie outside that range, uh, and that's kind of taking into account almost uh, the, the kind of known uh, unknowns, things, uh, you know, because the models are not independent, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so uh, the, these previous um, studies all uh, integrate information from models, from observations, and from our physical understanding of how the system um, works. And that allows us to make uh, the assessment um, statement. And that means that when we get, um, notice uh, actually that we were only willing to say something about this likely uh, range, the, the, the kind of, um, the, the central part of the distribution. Nothing really about the tails, nothing about the extreme uh, warming rates. Um, and that means that when we get to statements, uh, uh, and Thomas brought one out, which was that the temperature change for the end of the 21st century is likely to exceed one and a half degrees for all RCP scenarios except RCP 2.6, you might ask the question, well, for RCP 8.5, it must be greater than likely. Uh, it must be either very likely or even virtually certain. And the reason why we couldn't make that statement is because we limited ourselves to only saying something about the likely uh, range uh, of temperatures. So, uh, and then we can go on to say um, uh, things about other uh, potential uh, um, targets or, 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 or sort of iconic temperature um, 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 thresholds uh, in the system. So the, the question then is, what about regional changes? Uh, what about other variables? Uh, in the system? Well, the kind of short answer is that we don't have this huge body of evidence uh, with independent studies looking at, uh, for example, the rainfall change over the UK. Um, um, so we have to uh, um, kind of, if you like, uh, condition some of our statements on the fact that the global mean temperature is rising. Luckily, that there are things which, there are patterns of climate change which come out of models which have been robust across uh, generations uh, of models. So we see here, these are figures uh, showing uh, temperature changes on the left and rainfall changes on the right, uh, scaled by global mean. So this is the temperature change for a global mean, uh, uh, for a degree of global mean temperature increase. Uh, and we see some familiar features. The top models are older models and the bottom models are newer models. So we see that there's a, there's a polar amplification uh, in the northern hemisphere, the Arctic, uh, and, and the northern high latitudes tends to warm the most. The land areas warm more than the ocean, uh, and that's not just because of the heat capacity. That's to do with uh, um, physical processes involving the boundary layer and, and evaporation and things like that. And we see um, more complex structure in the precipitation, um, but we do see some uh, features uh, more rainfall at high latitudes, um, some increases uh, in the uh, tropical Pacific, and some decreases in the subtropical regions. So there's a kind of idea that the subtropical regions are expanding uh, polewards as we go into the future. And those patterns have remained uh, relatively constant over generations uh, of models. Of course, that doesn't mean that every model shows that exactly that pattern uh, of warming. And uh, those are probably a bit too small, but what you see here is a subset of the models that go into the, uh, the, the figures that we've um, produced. Uh, uh, some showing uh, um, quite high levels of global change, those models with high climate sensitivities. Often they show um, uh, the land-sea contrast, a minima in warming in the North um, Atlantic and in the Southern Ocean to do with ocean uh, heat uptake processes. Um, uh, and in some uh, uh, models, there's one over on the left-hand side which uh, has a notable cooling uh, over the North Atlantic. We don't really understand why that's the case, but we included that model uh, as, a, as part of the democracy. 
Um, because of this spread uh, between models, we can also um, more concisely uh, demonstrate uh, the uncertainty in the projections by showing uh, the mean, in this case for the precipitation at the end of the century under RCP 8.5, the blue areas showing increased precipitation, uh, the, the, the red and yellow colours showing decreased precipitation. But we have stippling uh, in the regions where uh, there, uh, we essentially believe the signal to be large uh, and robust, um, and hatching in regions where we uh, believe the signal either to be weak, uh, to the signal to actually just, just be weak, and the, the other, where it's not hatched and not stippled, it's kind of intermediate. Um, uh, that is, of course, just uh, based on the raw CMIP5 output. It's not a, a complete scientific assessment of what the projections in precipitation uh, will be. For that, you have to read, unfortunately, some of the many words uh, that we wrote. So, given... Um, uh, the global mean changes, as I mentioned, we can make statements which are conditional uh, on, the, on the global warming because we don't have a huge number of studies looking at, for example, uh, hot and cold extremes uh, under these RCPs, but we have um, uh, studies going back um, uh, which, in which there are similar changes in different scenarios uh, and in different models. And we come up, this is a uh, subset of, and a, a paraphrasing of some of the statements that appear in the summary for policymakers um, uh, and appear in the executive, chapter, the executive summary of uh, uh, our chapter. Um, I, I, I perhaps um, pick out one, uh, which I'm going to say something more about, um, the Arctic summer sea ice uh, to melt back to ice-free conditions and that to be likely, i.e. greater than 66% chance happening, uh, by mid-century under RCP 8.5. And that is one of the assessment statements that we made in which we sub-selected some of the models based on their um, performance. So let me just show you um, the graph, which is again um, reproduced from the SPM. It's the Northern Hemisphere September sea ice extent. Um, uh, the, the, if we look, just concentrate on the red um, the, and red and orange colours, which are the RCP 8.5. Uh, what we see in the uh, dotted line is the multi-model average for all the models uh, in the CMIP 5 archive, which shows ice-free conditions uh, as indicated by this dashed um, uh, horizontal line at about 2080. Uh, if we sub-select the models, actually only five in this case, which we believe to have a good reproduction of the trends and other aspects of sea ice over the 20th century, uh, then you get the solid uh, dash line in which the rate of decline of sea ice is very much larger and, in fact, we become ice-free by 2050. And that's because we have, again, a number of studies which have looked at this problem and we uh, were robustly able to sub-select the models which we thought were good uh, at reproducing um, the real world. So it's not just the raw, raw ensemble, the raw model output, it's building in information from observations and from, and from our understanding. Um, Thomas uh, mentioned the, the atlas, um, uh, which uh, I again um, advertise here. Um, it, it shows um, just temperature and precipitation. It has information about uncertainties, but again, uh, as perhaps a health warning, um, it's really based on the raw ensemble output of CMIP5. Um, so we have the median, uh, the 25th percentile, and 75th percentile, and various time series. Um, uh, you, you know, in order to interpret what you see in the atlas, you have to really look uh, at um, some of the detailed discussion uh, around the regions. And we've hopefully, within the atlas figure captions, highlighted which sections correspond uh, to which regions. Uh, this just shows uh, the, the um, precipitation. Uh, interestingly, of course, uh, in, the, in the UK, we're in one of these hatch regions, um, which suggests that we're, we're kind of on the edge of, of, a, of the, the kind of um, expansion of the subtropics, particularly uh, in summer. Uh, this is for a summer, a extended summer uh, average. So some uncertainty uh, around the UK changes. I just wanted to end uh, with one 
th this is now moving into perhaps my own um, personal um, uh, research area. But again, to give you an idea of how complicated uh, uh, it is to assess regional um, climate projections. Um, so what I'm showing here, and incidentally, this figure, although it's a bit fuzzy, it looks better uh, on, on the screen, or it looks better on my computer, uh, is generated uh, by uh, the KNMI um, Atlas uh, Explorer uh, program, um, uh, which has the CMIP5 data and produces maps which look very similar uh, uh, to the Atlas, and you can indeed reproduce some of the Atlas figures using that, but it has more variables in uh, for those who are interested, so it's more interactive. You can choose seasons, regions, uh, etc., etc. Uh, but I just wanted to plot this uh, figure, which is the rainfall change uh, in the uh, tropical Pacific, um, uh, in this case under RCP 8.5, and you see it doesn't have the stippling on, but I assure you that the, the increase in rainfall uh, in, the, in the tropical Pacific region here um, is robust. It's a kind of robust finding across um, all the models. Um, you may ask, why have I chosen the middle of the ocean to be interested in rainfall changes? It's because this region has an important teleconnection or remote Im influence on other regions uh, all over the world. And the reason... Um, this uh, rainfall maximum occurs in the models uh, is uh, because it's kind of anchored to an enhancement of temperature change uh, in the tropical Pacific. So there's a sort of local maxima in temperature change in the tropical Pacific sea surface temperatures in the region. Um, that uh, is in part uh, related uh, to... Uh, the, the mean pattern of uh, latent heat flux or evaporation uh, over the ocean. Uh, something that's easy, quite easy to model, but something that's very difficult uh, to observe. Um, we also note that there are common biases in models uh, in this region. They all tend to have sea surface temperatures which are too cool and extend too far into the, um, the West Pacific. So it's got known biases. It's, it's, this pattern is driven by a variable... Uh, which is difficult to observe. Um, and in fact, although the pattern is, is kind of symmetrical between the east and the west, there are different physical processes which are responsible for the East Pacific warming in comparison to the West Pacific warming. And the West Pacific is largely a result of uh, changes in circulation uh, in the ocean, whereas the East Pacific is more an atmospheric uh, uh, um, process. Um, so... There's, there's, if you like, a, a degree of scientific uncertainty uh, behind this result, despite the fact that the models show robust um, change. And this is important, as I said, because of the remote influence, but also because it has an influence on um, um, El Nino and its teleconnections and the occurrence uh, or, or potential increase in frequency uh, of extreme events. And again, this shows that there are papers which have come out since the publication of the... Um, uh, the AR5, you know, so, you know, the, the science moves on um, rather rapidly. So just to end, challenges uh, in making future uh, projections. Um, uh, I think uh, there are still uncertainties at the global mean uh, level. Uh, we found a way of tackling that uh, uh, in AR5, and there are independent lines of estimates, uh, there are ind independent lines of evidence that we can call on. Um, in terms of more regional climate change, there are robust features that emerge uh, on very large scales. Um, uh, those are just uh, uh, some on thermodynamic rainfall just means the enhancement um, um, of rainfall just due to increased moisture. Uh, for certain variables, we're learning how to take the ensemble of different models and calibrate them or exclude models uh, which we think are not as good as uh, other models or reweight. Uh, in some way, but that is no, by no means works for every variable uh, in the climate system. Um, we are beginning to look at the models in detail in some of the physical processes and understand some of the aspects uh, of the regional variability, and the example at the end there was the tropical Pacific rainfall change. But our models are still imperfect, um, uh, our observations are still incomplete, and our theory is underdeveloped, so we've still got plenty of work to do particularly when we're thinking about the, the problem of regional climate change, extremes, other variables, um, et cetera, et cetera. 
And I think the way we can get organised within the community is perhaps to more routinely try and combine the evidence from um, um, models, observations and understanding. So I kind of like the idea of the regional MIP as uh, we haven't colluded on that particular conclusion. Um, and just to finally end, the, the, the chapter uh, before us uh, uh, it, it looks at near-term change uh, in which the role of natural variability is, is, is equally important as the force response.